Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today, Biosimilars Development in Autoimmune and Inflammatory Diseases, Clinical Progress in an Evolving Regulatory Environment. Our agenda today includes several parts. Uh, in the first part, I will be describing the landscape of clinical trials for biosimilars in autoimmune and inflammatory diseases for these four innovator drugs, hot drugs and autoimmune, adalimumab, etanercept, efeximab, and rituximab program. My name is Laura Runkel, and I'm an associate director in the therapeutic area autoimmune and inflammation um, for Sightline. I'm uh, joined today by my data monitor colleagues, Christina Vasilio and Astrid Kurnayawan, who will be covering the physician research on biosimilar perception and adoption, payers' strategies to promote biosimilar adoption, U.S. and EU, and then uh, wrapping up with commercial impact of biosimilars on, in, in select uh, autoimmune dis indications. About the data that I will be presenting in this first part of the presentation, uh, we'll be including the Phase 1 to Phase 3 industry-sponsored trials for autoimmune and inflammatory diseases for these hot drugs, the, those that I just mentioned. Um, these have come off patent in recent years in, in most of the major markets, so this has launched a uh, avid uh, competition to join uh, into a lucrative market globally. The trials that we'll be looking at were those that initiated between the beginning of 2011 and uh, through the end of 2017. That's this year. Uh, keep in mind that the data was available as of April 21st, 2017, so the data for this year will be partial. The trials that were initiated in this data set um, were sponsored by 54 sponsors, uh, run globally. Some of those sponsors ran only individual uh, country trials, such as in South Korea or India, for example. However, the major uh, sponsors are the 16 sponsors we'll be focusing most of our attention on who targeted the broad and global geography in their phase three. And so those will be the ones that we'll be talking about the most. We'll be looking into some of the study design features that might distinguish them and um, give them an advantage in the global market. Keep in mind, please, that for the TNF uh, alpha antagonists, adalimumab, etanercept, and infliximab, there are multiple indications that they've been approved for. With the exception of etanercept, all of them have been approved for um, these six indications. Um, when it comes to the phase three efficacy trials, uh, we'll be um, looking a little bit more at uh, which choices were made for the efficacy uh, demonstration. biosimilar regulatory environment has evolved rather slowly. Uh, Europe led the way, developing a regulatory pathway that um, was first drafted at the beginning of this century, and the first milestone was uh, their draft guidance that was rolled out in the year 2000. It was later uh, updated and actually um, adopted in, in 2004, and in the intervening time up until um, 2015, um, there were adoptions around the world in other places and other major and other markets. But the FDA only finally released their final biosimilars guidance in 2015. Um, biosimilarity is defined in these regulations as the trial uh, that are focused on demonstrating comparable or similar uh, safety and efficacy, and as I mentioned already, the efficacy need only be demonstrated in one of the approved indications um, so that uh, the biosimilarity can be uh, shown against a reference um, innovator drug um, in um, 2017, the FDA uh, added additional um, draft rules that uh, go beyond uh, the biosimilarity demonstration, and, and this is um, 
touching on uh, interchangeability that we would be uh, expecting in the clinic where uh, biosimilar would be switched out for the innovator drug um, and possibly multiple uh, uh, switches would occur in the history of a person's treatment. So the interchangeability is uh, something that was looked at because of a risk of, of, uh, that one could imagine would come up in clinical practice. So when we get to looking at the study designs, uh, considering what the um, source of the innovator drug is uh, for comparisons in the clinical trials is important. Here we can see that these biosimilar clinical trials um, actually uh, grew um, substantially from when we first started to analyze this data. The trials started in, in 2011, uh, numbered only six, but by the time uh, we get to 2016, there's 40 biosimilar trials that were initiated. You can see for these different innovator drugs that there is a certain um, fluctuation in the number of trial starts. For example, adalimumab programs uh, started to really initiate um, substantially from 2013 going forward and have really a, a large uh, percentage of the trial starts in each of those subsequent years. Here again, you can see how 2017 has got partial information available, uh, so we expect to see um, a, a similar trend uh, towards the end of the year and next year. Looking in more granular detail at the uh, trends that are happening across this uh, six-year time frame, um, you can see uh, the phases laid out for each of the uh, innovator drug programs. In 2011, um, most of the trials were early phase, the phase one or phase one two, for potentially safety and um, and for um, PK studies. And there is one phase three study for an etanercept biosimilar that was run exclusively in South Korea. By 2012, uh, we're already seeing a substantial increase of, uh, in the trial starts, and some of the milestones in that year are a peak in the number of rituximab trial starts. Uh, they fall off from um, 2012 going forward. Uh, Celtrion, whose uh, first biosimilar of afliximab was approved in the EU and uh, more recently in the U.S., um, had already uh, a start of their uh, extension studies from their main pivotal phase three inflex uh, uh, trial. So they had a very early start. Going forward into um, 2013, um, we can see that some of the uh, first global phase three studies for etanercep and Adalimumab programs had initiated by that time, and as I mentioned earlier, just going forward from um, from that point, uh, the adalimumab um, programs continue to increase. Uh, in 2014, we also see that there's a peak in a Tanercept trial starts, uh, so these programs are unfolding uh, slightly differently over time. Overall, the adalimumab programs do dominate, and um, their growth ha has continued through uh, to the current time. As I mentioned in my introductory slide, these are uh, trials that were uh, initiated globally by all um, sponsors, but going forward, we'd like to look more at who the main sponsors are going to be. Uh, so to evaluate that, I wanted to uh, show you some data about the 47 trials that are initiated by just the 16 sponsors who have uh, phase three trials that go beyond a single uh, country or region. Uh, so in this uh, um, slide, we can see that there are um, different geographies that are uh, targeted for enrollment in these phase three programs. In this, pro, uh, this uh, 
analysis, uh, global means the EU and the U.S., as well as um, regions outside of those two main markets. And you can see that some of these uh, these sponsors have focused on um, the broadest possible range, the global. Uh, some have um, actually focused only on the non-U.S. Uh, locations. This may reflect some of the uncertainty in the regulatory environment in the U.S. Um, in addition, there are sponsors who uh, focus just on Europe and the U.S. for enrolling their uh, their phase three studies. And then, as you can see, Europe or U.S. targeted um, in some cases as well. Uh, for uh, sponsors that included some of these broader um, uh, regions for their phase three enrollment. There's uh, some that also targeted uh, just the countries that uh, they're based in, such as India, Russia, uh, for example, BioCAD, Biotech is one of those. Uh, among these sponsors, it's interesting to note that we have large pharma represented. We have also a biosimilar specialist that uh, came into being um, uh, as the biosimilar market uh, became more uh, clearly uh, open for global competition. That would be like Celtrion and uh, Coherus. There's also joint ventures such as Samsung Bioepis and uh, Fuji Film Kiawa, and they are uh, ventures between established biotech or, or pharma companies and uh, a specialist in the uh, biosimilars area. We also see quite a lot of par uh, partnerships um, in among the sponsors here, such as Momenta and Shire, and um, some that have actually just focused in on a certain region like uh, MabBion, uh, which is uh, located in Poland, but is uh, aiming for the Eastern European market. So these are our major sponsors who are running Phase Three programs. Another way of looking at the competitive landscape is to uh, have a look at where these programs fall in terms of approval um, and um, Phase Three status. These are, again, just the uh, programs that are have the broadest uh, enrollment geography, but uh, are uh, um, also likely to be competing with each other in the global market. Uh, for the four innovators, uh, you can see uh, in the different quadrants a, a different amount of of competition. The adalimumab um, program certainly are the most competitive, and uh, infliximab, rituximab, and, and tanercept all have. Um, fewer uh, competitors in their arena. Uh, it, at the center of the bullseye, where we see that there's approved and launched drugs as of uh, April 2017, um, all of these innovator programs have uh, seen at least one approval in, in the arena so far. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of competition, and we're going to look a little bit at, at how they might distinguish themselves um, through their clinical design program. Uh, one uh, distinguishing characteristic for uh, the various programs could be uh, whether there was a switching component in the phase three studies. As we know, uh, we need to demonstrate biosimilarity, but also um, to be able to assess within any single patient population uh, how they respond to uh, both drugs, the innovator, as well as the biosimilar. Switching components are, are important and, and often seen, particularly in phase three. And as I mentioned, with the regulatory pathway uh, that has just been rolled out uh, in, in draft form by the FDA, Having a U.S. sourced innovator uh, in your program could possibly help down the road when you're looking for the interchangeability designation in the U.S. market. Uh, the, uh, all of these programs have a little bit of a difference between them, but um, most of them, with the exception of a Tannercept, included a U.S. sourced innovator in their phase three switching studies. Um, it's uh, interesting to note that Tannercept has some, Embryl has some patent protections in the U.S. that, that may 
um, give these competitive programs a little more time to uh, to come back and, and ch- check that and test it against U.S. source material later on. It's interesting also to note that in Fliximab, um, of the five uh, phase three studies that were run, um, three of them did not have a switching component at all. And we did note uh, in the earlier slide that uh, there are several um, approved drugs already for that biosimilar. Another way of looking at this is the comparison between the various programs and uh, in terms of the geographic scope, uh, where they ran their trials and where they uh, source their innovator. Um, there's quite some variation here, but I think what you can see is the broadest um, programs were run by Beringer Ingelheim and Cell Tryon, where they largely ran global studies, and also that's true for Amgen. And they also tested in their switching studies both uh, EU and U.S. source innovator material. Again, um, something that could help them in the U.S. market going forward. Um, Some of the uh, programs uh, focused exclusively on getting the EU uh, approval. Um, For example, Samson Bioapis has uh, only used the EU source material and um, also only enrolled in um, in global studies that did not include uh, the U.S., Some of the uh, uh, sponsors towards the bottom also only focused on uh, evaluating the EU source material, and even though they may have had global scope, they may need to come back later uh, when they're looking to file in the U.S. if they want interchangeability designation. Uh, A further uh, look at where these programs have gone in terms of when they are just the biosimilars that have been approved. Um, Here you can see in the right column that the approval dates are available for some of these biosimilars and um, and compare those to the scope of their uh, geographic uh, enrollment as well as the innovator source. Um, what stands out here again is that um, those that have only EU source material um, uh, will need to presumably uh, satisfy uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, FDA when it comes to interchangeability later, but several of them have already been approved. Uh, um, Novartis is a Tanercept and uh, Samson Bioreps is. Um, a tanner uh, excuse me, uh, infliximab. Uh, interesting to note here that there was no switching component to, to those uh, phase three studies as well by Bioepis, and so it'll be interesting to see how they fare um, when it comes to interchangeability. Another study design feature that is important for consideration later in the market is uh, where the efficacy studies were um, were chosen to be evaluated. As I mentioned earlier, only one uh, of the approved indications needs to be demonstrated in phase three for the biosimilar compared to the innovator. And um, a quick look at this graph shows you that most of the programs uh, looked at rheumatoid arthritis, though there are several that o- focus only on psoriasis. Um, and knowing as we do that TNF antagonists are uh, largely um, prescribed for um, for RA, th- it, this may not be a surprise that the RA um, indication was, was chosen. But it's interesting that psoriasis would be also included. Um, for infliximab, uh, the uh, prescriptions for inflammatory bowel disease are, are most often seen, uh, and it's not as favored uh, as the other TNF antagonists for rheumatoid arthritis, but um, still RA was chosen um, for the efficacy studies there. Uh, the the um, sponsors that uh, have chosen more than one indication may be poising themselves for a better penetration into the market as the 
efficacy data will be available to hand to the prescribing uh, physicians, and, and they won't need to uh, rely on an extrapolation, um, which uh, may or may not be as convincing to physicians as it is um, in the clinical pathway. So Burringer has certainly um, been the most um, diligent in terms of uh, choosing multiple indications to, to evaluate the, the um, efficacy. And, uh, finally, I just wanted to share um, uh, a quick look at what might be influencing the choice of indications. Uh, because this is a very highly competitive area, you would think that clinical timelines would be important. And so uh, what's shown here is uh, what the prevalence is for the, the six uh, approved indications uh, here on the right. Uh, psoriasis is the most prevalent by far, and, and um, RA is the next most prevalent. Um, we looked at the clinical timelines for enrolling of um, pivotal trials in, in these indications from um, Trial Predict. Uh, there we were looking at some comparable studies. These were registrational studies that were run for biologics, and they were run in the same um, geographies as the uh, trials that I was just speaking about. So there's quite a robust uh, data set for the uh, timeline information here. What I found striking was that psoriasis, uh, which was so commonly chosen um, for uh, phase three efficacy studies um, as well as RA, uh, enrolls very quickly. So it's possible that um, this uh, quick timeline is, uh, actually supports the choice of psoriasis as well as RA in, um, in efficacy studies for biosimilars. So just to summarize this portion of our presentation today, I wanted to highlight how we've seen an overall trend in the growth of biosimilar starts since 2011. And the adalimumab program certainly have dominated, particularly in the uh, 2013 to the current time um, range. Uh, rituximab programs uh, seem to peak uh, in their trial starts um, in 2012 and to fall off some in, in subsequent years. Uh, rituximab is approved only for RA and for oncology indications. Uh, so some of the, the attrition that we see here uh, it, it may be a move over to looking at um, efficacy in oncology, but we have also seen that there are some programs that have discontinued, including a Beringer Engelheim's a rituximab program that had already reached uh, phase three, and Teva was originally in the programs too, but um, uh, is not currently running rituximab biosimilar trials. To highlight again that the six main sponsors of biosimilars that have reached the phase three program include a variety of different types of sponsors, uh, large pharma, biosimilar specialists, joint ventures, par partnerships, as well as some small companies that are potentially also going to be in the global competition. Um, this has clearly been a, a very attractive area and um, it's it's drawn a lot of competition from a variety of, of entities here. I highlighted also some of the study de design features, uh, those programs that included a uh, switching component so that um, one can demonstrate a, a comparable PK efficacy in the same patients, but also um, those that um, are switching over to U.S. source material that may be better poised to uh, to demonstrate interchangeability later on. And um, finally, I, I had uh, spoken about the uh, choice of uh, diseases for the efficacy studies. Not surprisingly for the uh, anti-TNF, the RA a choice was, was most common, but um, psoriasis and uh, Crohn's disease were also um, evaluated in some programs, and, and those that most broadly uh, evaluated efficacy would be expected to be poised for a more competitive edge in the market. And so with that, I will conclude my portion of the webinar and turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Laura. 
So what I wanted to focus on is uh, data monitor healthcare's research around physician sentiment towards indication extrapolation biosimilar infliximab adoption and physicians' expectations for future biosimilar use. I'll be specifically focusing on rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. Just to note, when this research was conducted in 2016, biosimilar infliximab, which is marketed as Remsema and Infectra, was the only biosimilar approved and available in the autoimmune space in Japan and major European markets. Remsema received approval for all the indications the originator brand Remicade is licensed for, but Remsema's approval was primarily based on clinical data from two studies, a pivotal pharmacokinetic study in patients with ankylosing spondylitis and a pivotal efficacy and safety study in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. We also have a situation where rheumatologists had clinical data for Remsema in rheumatic indications but gastroenterologists, who arguably are the biggest prescribers of infliximab, since it is the gold standard biologic in IBD, were being asked to prescribe the biosimilar with minimal data in IBD indications. The first thing I'd like to focus on is specialist confidence in prescribing biosimilars that have been approved based on indication extrapolation. This is where a biosimilar is approved for an indication which the reference brand is approved for, though the biosimilar has not been studied clinically in that indication. The approval is based on the biosimilar's safety and efficacy in a different indication which the reference brand is approved for, and non-clinical evidence which supports that there should be no difference from the reference brand. The rationale for indication extrapolation is that it is cost prohibitive to require biosimilar developers to conduct clinical trials in each of the indications that the originator is approved, as this would increase the cost of developing biosimilars. Equally important is the fact that biologic characterization is sufficiently advanced, that only confirmatory clinical data are required. Regulatory bodies highlight that the most sensitive homogeneous patient populations should be used in biosimilar trials. The patient population with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, for example, do not represent a homogeneous group based on the typical patient age, comorbidities, and rate of disease risk, relapse, and complications. So while economically and scientifically indication extrapolation makes sense, overall physicians indicate discomfort prescribing a biosimilar in an indication approved by indication extrapolation. Looking at our survey data here, the majority of rheumatologists and gastroenterologists indicated that they are either less likely to prescribe or will not prescribe a biosimilar if it was approved by indication extrapolation for that indication. So the picture this paints is that gastroenterologists should have been more reluctant to use Remsema, which was approved in IBD via indication extrapolation, compared to rheumatologists who had clinical data for the biosimilar in rheumatic disease. So did this hold true with actual prescribing? If we turn to look at our survey data on the prescribing of biosimilar infliximab by rheumatologists and gastroenterologists, we can see that this is not true across two dimensions. The first dimension is that a greater number of gastroenterologists were prescribing biosimilar infliximab than rheumatologists in 2016. This is true in both Japan and the five major EU markets, though I'm going to focus increasingly on the five major EU markets from here onwards, simply because our sample size of gastroenterologists and rheumatologists prescribing biosimilar infliximab in Japan is quite small. This slower adoption in Japan, despite the fact that Biosimilar infliximab was approved earlier in Japan than in Europe could be due to Japanese specialists not having access to biosimilar infliximab more broadly. Looking at the data here, almost two-thirds of surveyed gastroenterologists were prescribing biosimilar infliximab versus less than a third of rheumatologists. The second dimension here is that gastroenterologists in Japan and the five major EU markets indicate on average a greater proportion of their infliximab use consists 
of biosimilar infliximab than rheumatology. Focusing on the EU5, we can see that European gastroenterologists indicate around 20% of their infliximab use is biosimilar infliximab, while rheumatologists indicate biosimilar infliximab only makes up, our, makes up around 10%. What these data suggest is that not only are twice as many gastroenterologists using biosimilar infliximab compared to rheumatologists, but on average, among biosimilar infliximab prescribers, gastroenterologists are prescribing it twice as much as rheumatologists. So this goes against the established wisdom that biosimilar uptake would be harmed by indication extrapolation. But what other, other factors may have resulted in gastroenterologists adopting biosimilar infliximab more rapidly than rheumatologists? Investigating the types of patient specialists have used biosimilar infliximab in is revealing and suggests a possible reason of why we see higher uptake among gastroenterologists. We asked survey prescribers of biosimilar infliximab to indicate which patient groups they had used the biosimilar in. Again, I'm focusing on the five major EU markets here due to the small sample size in Japan. The majority of rheumatologists and gastroenterologists in the five major EU markets indicated that they prescribed biosimilar infliximab to biologic naive patients. Around 40% of both specialties indicated that they switched patients from Remicaid to biosimilar infliximab, and roughly 20% of respondents in both specialties indicated that they switched patients from other branded biologics to biosimilar infliximab. So why are these data compelling? Well, we need to consider the entire treatment paradigm within the IBD and rheumatic indications. Infliximab is predominantly used as a first-line biologic agent in IBD, which means that the core use of infliximab in IBD is in biologic naive patients. This therefore provides gastroenterologists with an easy opportunity to use biosimilar infliximab in the patient group they seem most willing to use it in. On the opposite side of the fence, in rheumatic indications, infliximab would not typically be the biologic of choice for biologic naive patients. Rheumatologists tend to prescribe Enbrel or Humira to biologic naive patients. And in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, we have also started to see a higher level of first-line prescribing of Altemra. So in rheumatic disease, infliximab is typically used in later lines in biologic experienced patients or more complicated cases. So rheumatologists have fewer opportunities to use biosimilar infliximab in the patient group they seem most willing to use it in. I think this goes some way towards explaining the high use of biosimilar infliximab by gastroenterologists. Another key factor will have been payer pressure, and my colleague Astrid will talk about this more later. What's interesting is that the higher current use of biosimilar infliximab by gastroenterologists also appears to have impacted their future expectations for biosimilar adoption. Surveyed gastroenterologists and rheumatologists were asked what proportion of their patients they expect to prescribe biosimilars to three years post-launch by patient group. We looked at biologic naive patients, patients switched to a biosimilar of the reference brand, and patients switched to a non-reference brand biosimilar. Again, you can see that gastroenterologists and rheumatologists expect a greater proportion of biologic naive patients to receive a biosimilar in the future compared to patients switched to a biosimilar of the reference brand or a non-reference brand biosimilar. This again indicates that physicians from both specialties are keen to use biosimilars in cases that are perhaps less complicated and not in patients that have experienced treatment failure with one or more branded biologic therapies. The second key point here is that for each of the three patient groups we explored, gastroenterologists estimated that a higher proportion of patients 
will be receiving a biosimilar compared to rheumatology. Again, this goes against the initial concern around indication extrapolation, especially considering Laura mentioned that most clinical programs are being conducted in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. So what could be the rationale behind this? We think this is a situation where actual experience with biosimilars supports expectations for greater future use. A greater proportion of gastroenterologists have used biosimilars compared to rheumatologists, and they have used them in more patients than rheumatologists have. And this has led to greater experience and greater expectations for future use. It's likely that as we see greater use of biosimilars by rheumatologists or dermatologists, we will see a similar dynamic where initial reservations and concerns highlighted by specialists will alleviate in the future as experience grows. So the data as discussed paints the physician picture, but as mentioned, uptake has also been driven by payers. And Astrid will now talk more about the strategies payers are employing to promote biosimilar use. Thanks, Christina. So Payers are especially keen on the development of biosimilars as they present big cost-saving opportunities. And according to an interview from Scripps Intelligence, the cumulative potential savings for biosimilars is $120 billion in aggregate over the next five years for the US and the EU market. And of the biosimilar compounds, TNF inhibitors represent a large portion of that opportunity as the drugs have multiple approval and several indications as you've seen with high prevalence. So given the opportunity, payers are most invested in putting together the strategies to promote the uptake of these anti-TNF biosimilar products. However, as biosimilars are not viewed as interchangeable in most markets, automatic substitution at the pharmacist level, which is traditionally the most effective way to promote generic uptake, is not utilized in most countries. So payers, therefore, have to resort to varying control and access methods to promote these biosimilars. And these strategies have differed across the US, the EU, and even within the EU countries themselves, which then have resulted in varying levels of success for the uptake of biosimilar TNF-alpha inhibitors. So today, we're going to look at case studies from the US, the Germany, and the UK to understand how different payers employ strategies for current biosimilars and prepare for the launch of future ones. Let's start with the US market. So payers in the U.S. have had limited experience with the biosimilar TNF inhibitors, as the earliest approval was in April of 2016. And although there are five TNF biosimilar inhibitors approved for each TNF active ingredient, etanercept, adalimumab, and infliximab, only the infliximab biosimilars in Flectra and Renflexis have launched. Biosimilars for Enbrel and Humira are tied up in patent litigation and are not expected to launch anytime soon. Further, in the US, the utilization management of drugs will actually differ according to the drug's route of administration. As Remicade is IV administered, biosimilars in Flectra and Nonflexus will have different management strategies compared to Arelzi, Mgvita, and Siltezo. So let's look at how these utilization management structures between IV and FC drugs differ in more detail for the payer side. As a general rule, subcutaneous or oral drugs that are self-administered, such as Humira and Enbrel, are covered under what's called the pharmacy benefit. Drugs that are injected or infused by a healthcare professional in the doctor's office or infusion centers or hospital outpatient centers, such as Remicade, will usually fall under the medical benefit. Now, pharmacy benefit drugs are usually subject to contracting. Payers will contract for heavily rebated preferred products and then set up tiered formulary systems which have different patient out-of-pocket responsibility costs to drive the uptake of the contracted preferred product. Medical benefit IV drugs, on the other hand, are generally subject to fewer contracts, and although there are exceptions, as you'll see later with Remicade. More importantly, however, the patient responsibility for medical benefit medicines usually involves a deductible in which patients will meet that deductible because of the high cost of the specialty drug. And after meeting that out of pocket, the plan will usually pay for the remaining benefit year. 
So payers generally report for medical benefit drugs that there are fewer patient level utilization management strategies such as co-pays or co-insurances under this structure. So now let's look at how Infectra's experience has been as it launched in the U.S. nearly one year ago as a medical benefit drug for most payers. So one year after launch, Pfizer has reported that Inflector's sales has not impacted Johnson & Johnson's Remicade. Inflector garnered $172 million in global sales according to Pfizer's second quarter financial report. It only pulled in $40 million in the U.S. during that time, compared to the $2.24 billion in the market this year for Johnson & Johnson's Remicade. Our U.S. payers mentioned that the biosimilar price at the launch, coupled with the payers' existing contracts with Remicade, did not provide enough or incentive for payers to switch. Now, some payers took a softer approach and still continued to have Remicade and biosimilar infliximab as an option. As our first payer commented that we have a contract on Remicade, we do not save anything with the biosimilar. The biosimilar, however, is still available, and if physicians and patients choose to use it, we have not stopped it but we are not promoting the biosimilar at this point. Other payers, however, have been more aggressive with their approach and chose to take out the biosimilar altogether. As quoted in the second payer, the biosimilar launched at a 15% discount, but the average selling price discount for the Remicade was 30% below, so there was no financial benefit to use that new drug. We took a contract with Janssen to block Inflectra and we used Remicade because Pfizer was not doing anything. So we were able to get a discount on Remicade. So what would it take for the payers to promote the biosimilar infliximab? Well, according to our interviews with payers, they want at least a 20% biosimilar discount against the contracted price for Remicade to make that financial situation more attractive. Payers say that it's critical for the discount to help recoup the loss in contracting concession to Remicade in order for them to begin promoting biosimilar infliximab. Even so, payers caution that Pfizer should be prepared to face counteroffers from Johnson & Johnson. Ultimately, payers will want the best deal, and staying with a brand is an advantage as it minimizes the disruption for existing patients in having to switch to the biosimilar. This, coupled with reluctance from physicians to switch stable patients on Remicade to the biosimilar, which comprises, again, majority of the caseload, means that the biosimilar manufacturers have a high barrier to entry in this market. And now, with the launch of the second biosimilar infliximab Brimflexis, Merck recently announced a 35% discount for the product, which may also trigger further discounting wars between Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer to maintain or capture market share, respectively. Now that we've seen how biosimilar infliximab has fared under the medical benefit management, let's move on to the hypothetical management of drugs for the bio biosimilars that are on the pharmacy benefit side. Again, this remains speculative as biosimilars to Enbrel and Humira have not yet launched in the U.S. So, payers posit that a plausible strategy to increase the use of subcutaneously administered biosimilars, which fall under this pharmacy benefit, will lay largely on the patient's out-of-pocket payments. So, most payers say that the easiest target, again, is for using biosimilars will be in new patients. But for the existing patients, some payers say that they will be required to switch the biosimilars, while others say that maybe they'll be able to continue with the branded therapy in theory. However, as biosimilars are expected to have a lower out-of-pocket payment compared to the branded products, this copay differential is what's expected to drive the switching in the patients who are stable on the product. So I'm going to go through an example of what could happen with a drug that costs $2,000 a month. Currently, the preferred branded products have lower patient out-of-pocket copay costs compared to the non-preferred brands who have higher out-of-pocket costs. And in the copay structure, this difference is usually minor, as this is a flat fee for the drug regardless of the cost. And this difference of about $25 to $45 is not great enough to drive the uptake of these preferred drugs. Some payers believe that changing the paradigm of this, such that there is a flat copay for the preferred biosimilar, and a coinsurance, which is a patient responsibility based on the percentage of the drug's price for the non-preferred drug, 
will then help to promote the use of biosimilars, especially among the current users. Now, in this second scenario, the preferred drug does have a higher $100 copay, but that the non-preferred drug has a 25% coinsurance translating to a $500 out-of-pocket cost for the branded NDTNF. And ultimately, this is a difference of $400 between the preferred and the non-preferred drug. So although some payers aren't going to restrict patients from accessing the branded compounds, we anticipate that with restructured copays to coinsurance, these out-of-pocket costs associated with the biosimilars will become much lower compared to the branded biologics. And that in of itself will result in a strong financial incentive for patients to use the biosimilars. And as one U.S. payer corroborated as well, copay differentials will be the main way to drive the uptake of subcutaneously administered biosimilars. A $100 copay for a preferred biosimilar compared to the 25% cost for a branded drug will result in patients flocking to the biosimilar. So now that you've seen how contracts and copays are factors that impact the uptake of biosimilars in the US, let's look at the situation in Europe. So the European market has actually had a longer experience with TNF inhibitor biosimilars in the market. The first biosimilar approved was Inflectra in 2013. And since then, five more approvals have been granted, but only the biosimilars to Remicade and Embro have launched. We'll look at two case studies today to understand how the EU payers have managed the launch of these TNF inhibitor biosimilars. Let's now start with Germany. The German healthcare system encourages the use of biosimilars by establishing what's called prescription quotas. So under the quota system, payers outline a particular prescribing target percentage that physicians need to abide by. And these quotas are linked to either a financial penalty for reaching the quota, a financial incentive for reaching the quota, and or a financial incentive for exceeding the quota. And these are the basic building blocks to implementing the quotas. However, the structure and the details of the quotas differ among the 17 physician association groups across Germany. So even within the same country, there are biosimilar-friendly areas, and then there are areas where biosimilars are not generally promoted. How else do these quotas differ? Well, some quotas specify just one for the TNF biosimilar, just as a class. Others, however, will do so based on the route of administration. And even more so, other regions will specify a quota for the active ingredient, like a quota specifically for biosimilar infliximab. Some regions also specify different quotas based on physician specialties, where gastroenterologists will then have different quotas compared to dermatologists as well as rheumatologists. Now, although the quotas are structured differently, one German payer did observe that the regions with the highest uptake were those that had implemented incentives for exceeding the biosimilar quota. Now, we expect that biosimilar competition will intensify with the launch of multiple compounds with the same reference molecule, such as having two or more biosimilar intanercepts or infliximab. And payers say that with multiple biosimilars in the market, they intend to contract for specific preferred biosimilar brand in exchange for a more substantial rebate. And in that case, there are two ways in which payers plan to incentivize the use of a preferred biosimilar brand. One, payer, one is that payers could incentivize physicians by rewarding them with a flat payment for those physicians who switch and maintain their patients on the preferred rebated similar product. As quoted in the first German payer, there were six funds, three six funds who independently offered me a contract that provided 300 to 400 dollars, uh, 400 euros per patient to doctors who switch and maintain patients on a particular brand of biosimilar infliximab. Another way in which you could do this is that payers could do more of the same by implementing another quota, but this time for the volume prescribing of the preferred biosimilar as quoted by the second payer here. But in summary, the German, payer, German payers continue to resort to quotas linked to financial rewards or punishments for physicians to drive the uptake of their preferred biosimilars. Let's now look at how UK payers have dealt with the launch of the TNF biosimilars. In the UK, local payers resorted to gain-sharing agreements to promote TNF biosimilars. 
A shared savings agreement normally entails payers to collaborate with the hospital and to agree to use a biosimilar with the understanding that the gain from savings is shared between the payer and the hospitals themselves. While some local payers were quite active in their biosimilar promoting strategies and had provided incentives for switching, others did not provide incentives and hospitals did not switch. So as a result, there are areas where biosimilar uptake may be much higher compared to other regions in the UK. Now, in an attempt to find a more unifying way to promote the uptake, UK's national payer has produced a new framework intended to increase the use of biosimilars and to generate savings of 200 to 300 million pounds on the drugs bill each year by 2020 to 2021. An initial focus will be Advies Humira and Roche's Herceptin, which are due to face biosimilar competition in the UK. For this, the goal is now to reach 90% of biosimilar use within three months of launch. And for existing patients, the goal is to reach 80% biosimilar use within 12 months. Now, under this new framework, the providers will be given additional payments that will also cover the cost of switching patients. However, both local payers we interviewed and this national document also agree that gain shares and incentives will cease over time and that the use of biosimilar will be business as usual. And this thinking really highlights that the acceptance of biosimilars in the UK has been increasing since their launch. Now that we've seen both physician receptiveness and payer strategies for promoting biosimilars, I'll pass it on to Christina to discuss what this means in terms of commercial landscape in the future for the biosimilars. Thank you, Astrid. So what does the commercial landscape look like for key anti TNFs and their respective uh, biosimilars? In terms of the launch of anti-TNF biosimilars, the path is quite clear in Europe, where biosimilar infliximab and biosimilar etanethorp are already available, and we expect biosimilar adalimumab to also launch by late 2018. Similarly, in Japan, biosimilar infliximab is already available, and we have some clear assumptions around the launch of etanethorp and adalimumab biosimilars. The situation, however, is slightly more clouded in the US, Biosimilar infliximab launched in late 2016. Uh, we don't currently forecast the launch for biosimilar etanercept in the US, and this is based on Enbrel's so-called submarine patent, uh, potentially safeguarding it from biosimilar competition until 2028 or 2029. However, I should note that these patents have been challenged in the past, and we do expect that there will be further challenges down the road. For biosimilar adalimumab, we forecast the launch in the U.S. in Q1 2023. This is based on recent news from ABSI on the global resolution of all the intellectual property-related litigation with Amgen, which will delay the launch of Amgen's biosimilar adalimumab Amgevida in the U.S. until January 2023. While this does not preclude other biosimilar developers from undertaking an at-risk launch or successfully challenging patents held by APSI or designing around patents and using their own patent estate to support the biosimilar launch, we do believe it is unlikely for a biosimilar at Alimumab to launch in the U.S. before 2023. So now, looking at our aggregated forecast for rheumatoid arthritis across the U.S., Japan, and five major EU markets, the sales of the key subcutaneous originator anti-TNF biologics, Humira and Enbrel, are facing head headwinds as biosimilars launch in Europe and Japan. However, the overall sales of both brands will continue to grow, driven by U.S. price increases. Until 2023, when the launch of biosimilar adalimumab in the U.S. will cause rapid revenue declines. To note, we expect uh, anti-TNF biosimilars to launch at a 20 to 35% discount to the originator brand. And this is in line with what we've been seeing to date. Originator and TTNFs will lose revenue by two factors when it comes to biosimilars. The first is patient share loss to biosimilars. In total, we expect biosimilars to capture up to 55% of patient share. These are patients who would have otherwise been treated with the originator brand if biosimilars have not been available. 
The second factor is price erosion as the reference brand attempts to stave off deeper patient shared loss. We expect a price erosion of up to 30% for the branded biologics over our forecast. We also expect the biosimilars to decline in price over the forecast period. In essence, we anticipate that there will be a 20 to 35% gap maintained between the branded product and the biosimilar. Even though Enbrel will not see a direct biosimilar etanercept competitor in the U.S., we do expect marginal cross-brand erosion from biosimilar adalimumab on Enbrel. And we do expect Enbrel's price to decline to keep up uh, with the declining net price of Humira over the forecast period. A very similar dynamic is expected in IBD. Our aggregated forecast for Crohn's disease across the U.S., Japan, and five major EU markets shows a steep decline in the sales of Remicade over the 10-year forecast period and a decline in the sales of Humira from 2023 onwards following the launch of Adalimumab Biosimilar in the U.S. I'll now pass on to Laura to talk through our key closing thoughts. Thank you, Christina and Astrid. We'd like to leave you with some closing thoughts from from these data analyses. Uh, Sponsors running phase three efficacy studies in more than one approved indication are better positioned to convince prescribing physicians to use the biosimilars. Most autoimmune inflammatory biosimilars programs employed switching components, enabling interchangeability um, for the EU countries. Um, This is uh, a designation that is made at the country level, whereas the FDA requirements for interchangeability, which is another level of data, uh, this has just been rolled out at the U.S. level as a uh, draft guidance, but going forward, uh, any program that included U.S. source materials will certainly have a better uh, chance of passing that hurdle when it becomes um, finalized. Increasing physician experience with biosimilars will drive increased future adoption despite initial concerns around factors such as indication extrapolation. Payers will continue to promote use of biosimilars as they stand to reap cost savings that are generated provided biosimilar manufacturers offer attractive launch pricing and or discounting. Originator manufacturers can weather biosimilar launches in Japan and the five EU major markets by offsetting sales declines with U.S. price increases, but overall sales will decline following biosimilar launches in the U.S. Thank you very much for joining us today, and I just did want to say that the copy of this webinar will be sent to registered uh, participants, and we have seen some questions about that coming through. Any additional questions that you'd like to submit, please do send them to the pharma at informa.com email address, and we'll also look to see what might have been submitted during the course of our webinar and get back to you uh, with answers. Thanks again for joining our webinar today.